Michael, thank you very much. And uh, for all of you who came down to, to Bliss Hall, uh, thank you very much for, for coming. I apologize that I couldn't be with you uh, this morning uh, in person. I certainly look forward to the opportunity when, uh, when that can uh, again happen. My, um, as uh, Michael indicated, I am the Latin America Research Professor with the Strategic Studies Institute uh, here at the War College. And as he also indicated, uh, one of my specialties going uh, back to about 2003 has been following the evolution of, of Chinese activities in, in Latin America, something that uh, continues to uh, be relevant, not only for our, our business uh, partners and, and organizations and in the region, but also in a range of different uh, security fashions. So today I'm going to give you an overview of um, those activities and uh, I look forward to the questions and answers that we have afterwards. I'm now going to uh, share my screen to initiate the presentation. So you should now be able to see uh, Chinese engagement with Latin America and the Caribbean, the PowerPoint slide. So I put it into slideshow mode. Okay. So as I indicated before, um, what I found is it's oftentimes important to start out this discussion with an understanding of what China is seeking, both globally and specifically in, in Latin America. And what I've found is that um, the piece of that engagement in Latin America is a subset, um, but it is broadly consistent with what it is seeking globally, although uh, what it uh, pursues in specific regions does vary in terms of the distance and the particular um, historical relationship China has had there. Its sensitivity uh, towards the United States, of course, uh, being uh, closer uh, to, to Latin America as well as a number of other factors. But in general, I like to point out that China's global engagement I see as principally driven by um, what I put out here, a strong, secure, prosperous China. So in many ways, I like to start out and really emphasize this because for me, although in many ways it is not any less impactful and in many ways is even more of a challenge than the Soviet Union during the Cold War, whereas for me, the Soviet Union sought a largely political military objective, which had an economic component to it. Um, in my case, I see China is principally pursuing economic objectives. However, given that, um, it has a strategy in terms of how to address and deal with global institutions, how to do political engagement across the world, how to have a military engagement, which I see as largely in support of those economic objectives. Hopefully, as I talk to you more about this, that what I mean by that will become clear. Overall, um, what I focus on is that as China seeks to be a wealthy and powerful nation, part of that is moving up key value added chains. It needs to have secure access to raw materials and the foodstuffs to feed the 1.4 billion Chinese people. And at the same time, it certainly needs to have access for the high value goods and services that it supplies to global markets. And oh, by the way, uh, the way in which that also supports having a strong, secure uh, Chinese state, both in the military and in other means. Along the way, what that means is that across the world, it does have to seek access to certain markets and, and supply. And, and frankly, it seeks to dominate the connectivity in terms of ports, in terms of other physical transportation infrastructure, but increasingly in terms of other types of infrastructure, which includes uh, telecommunications infrastructure, of which you may have heard a, a bit about, as well as uh, other types of things that you would be less likely to think of. For example, the infrastructure for the generation and transmission of electricity, or the infrastructure uh, for, for e-commerce, all of which are becoming increasingly important. Put that all together, um, and as you think of the old concept of, of China's uh, Silk Road or Belt and Road uh, diplomacy, and what is now talked increasingly about, uh, specifically China's digital Silk Road, what you realize is it's about getting what China needs, and it's about dominating global connectivity in order to have leverage to, to do that. I need to talk a little bit about um, some of the specific ways and means uh, globally, but specifically also in Latin America, that the PRC goes about that strategy. In general, what you see consistently is that China uses the leverage, the lure of the size of its market of those 1.4 billion people. It uses the uh, ability that it has through providing financial resources, its policy banks like China Development Bank and, and China Exim Bank to support the activities of its companies as they seek business and as they seek to finance different projects in, in ways that oftentimes other multinational corporations or, or governments uh, cannot. And it uses the coordination 
coordination of the state in various different ways. Um, it uses that coordination commercially to bring together a, a range of, of different companies and financing options. It uses that coordination to play a broad international game. Oftentimes, um, you know, holding out the lure of access to its markets through its regulatory capability in exchange for allowing Chinese companies into others. And frankly, part of that state apparatus is the use of its security services, the MSS and, and others, to frankly help its SOEs and, and others to systematically obtain, steal, and incorporate other technologies is part of that move up the value added chain. So in general, the national champions, if you will, that China often uses are its companies, sometimes and usually it's state-oriented companies, but also the idea of building ever better products, um, ever greater technology contents uh, that it acquires in a variety of, of different ways, and little by little accumulating capital. So you see its uh, banks and its companies uh, in many ways throughout the world increasingly moving into dominant positions in markets through mergers and acquisition activities, which then become a way for them to farther uh, acquire the technology that they need, the partnership that they need, um, and increasingly not just be you know, building the toys and inexpensive footwear of the world, but becoming beginning to do what Western European US organizations were long accustomed to doing, reaping the benefits of the return to capital. You know, who makes the decision about where technology is developed, where managerial decisions are made. It's a transformation that for those of us used to a world order that came out of the post-World War II and the Bretton Woods systems, it's difficult for us to fully grasp what that means. Oftentimes you may have heard the term Go, the Chinese game of Go, whereas we in the U.S. play, you know, chess or you know, even worse, checkers. Um, but that game of Go, Wei Qi, what we often miss is the fact that this is not just a military war of position or a political war of position, but it's fundamentally an economic war of position. For example, when we talk about China's interest in, in Panama, yes, the fact that it operates a significant number of of investments, including uh, operations on both sides of the Panama Canal, do open the possibility of military use, or at least military denial of transits of others to that canal. But I say that in the near term, um, the objective of being in Panama and economically dominating Panama with all the political influence that comes with that is the ability to use that to advance China's commercial position through Panama's role as a banking hub in the region, as well as an international logistics hub in the region, as it projects itself into Central America, as it pursues contracts elsewhere. And so um, it's important to understand how China is willing to achieve it so that we're looking for the right metrics and interpreting correctly the threats that those represent. Obviously, you've heard about uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, currently at 19 and possibly soon with Argentina, 20 states in Latin America and the Caribbean are part of that. You've also probably heard about China's digital Silk Road. This goes back to my comment about connectivity. This idea that's not just about building ports and building roads and, and railroads, but it's also about having its companies control and reap the value added and have the technology that dominates the telecommunications infrastructure and all the e-commerce and other things that hang on that infrastructure as part of that effort to dominate value added. When we talk about the economics though, it's important to understand that there are a number of other things in this interdependent world that China requires. Just as in many ways, China came of age in a world that was defined by other powers, the so to speak Bretton Woods system, the system that we put together with the United Nations and, and economic institutions after World War II, China recognizes that in order to really expand and dominate in that world, it needs to adjust those institutions not necessarily replace them or tear them down, but you find a systematic effort by China working within the United Nations and UN organizations such as ECLAC. You've probably heard a little bit about China's uh, efforts to basically blunt some of the criticisms within the World Health Organization with respect to, to coronavirus, but also other organizations such as the Inter-American Development Bank, which it joined in 2009, such as trans-regional organizations, such as the famous BRICS organization, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, uh, new organizations such as the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
In addition to revising that institutional space, China also seeks to revise the international financial space. So one of the big pushes through its banking activities, as well as the way that it tries to put contracts in RENMB, oftentimes at some cost to itself, its effort to get the RENMB inserted as a reserve currency within the IMF, something under the previous director, Christina Lagarde, uh, did successfully. That um, China recognizes that a world dominated by dollars in which only the United States can print the money that it wants, or secondarily, the, the euro, is a world in which China is financially handicapped. And so um, as China moves forward, it has really made a point not to dethrone completely the dollar, but to ensure the renminbi is a fundamental part of that. And the biggest new initiative in that regard, something that is going to actually happen this year within China itself, is the new digital renminbi or the use of digital currency. Um, and uh, frankly, it's an area in which uh, China is far ahead of where we are with the United States right now. And then in the political security space, I like to emphasize that China seeks to not only accept, but actually embrace this idea of multipolarity. What I mean by that, for example, in a case such as Venezuela, oftentimes the focus is, well, China just wants Venezuela's oil. And Venezuela does have 300 billion barrels of recoverable oil, according to current estimates. However, it's not just about that, or the fact that China is owed um, right about $19 billion by um, the Maduro government. But China recognizes, as it does in places like North Korea with Kim Jong-un, that um, it's actually to China's benefit to have certain countries that don't politically see things as the United States do. And so in many ways, um, China doesn't want to associate itself with the anti-US activities of the Maduro regime in Venezuela, but it's not in any hurry to help the United States solve its governance problem and the chaos in Latin America. Like North Korea, China seeks to avoid being tarred by being responsible for that. And it's certainly an inconvenience for Chinese companies, the disastrous situation in Venezuela, just like everyone else. Um, but it's oftentimes important to understand the double game that China is playing with regimes like Venezuela or with the regimes such as Argentina's uh, regime, the uh, regime of, of uh, Alberto and Cristina Fernandez, or the new uh, returning uh, MAS regime in, in Bolivia with uh, Luis Arce, um, and not assume that China just wants to help us out because it's economically efficient for it. There is a an understanding that that for China to advance, it doesn't want to create blocks like the Soviet Union did, but it certainly wants to allow a space in which the United States and the Washington consensus world is not the dominant force. Let me talk now a little bit about the trajectory of China's expansion in Latin America specifically. As you may recall, uh, China in 2001 was admitted into the World Trade Organization. Even prior to that, uh, China had been expanding um, relatively rapidly in terms of its commerce throughout the 1990s. However, throughout the 2000s, up until the world economic crisis of 2008 and shortly thereafter, um, a lot of China's expansion was principally about trade. So China was exporting through multi-Latinas and often U.S. and European firms, a lot of goods that it sold throughout Latin America. Uh, reciprocally, China was buying a lot of commodities, a lot of um, copper from Chile, a lot of iron from Brazil, for example, from entities like CBRD. But it didn't have a lot of companies on the ground. That all changed after 2008. And with about a two-year delay, um, in about 2010, we started seeing a rapid advance through mergers and acquisitions in sectors such as petroleum and mining, um, through incremental advance in telecommunications through companies like Huawei and ZTE, um, oftentimes through uh, gifts and other projects, um, loan-based projects in, in construction, um, companies like uh, like. Um, companies like Shanghai Dredging and others or the CCCC companies. Um, it, it was a little bit different in, in each sector, but that growing physical presence now meant that China and its companies had to be sensitive to the conditions on the ground, security conditions, political conditions, um, expropriations by Latin American countries, relations with um, local communities, local labor, local governments, environmental regulations. And the Chinese companies made a lot of errors and had a lot of friction in that learning process. 
uh, things actually trailed off a little bit um, as China's economic growth slowed in about 2014, 2015. Um, and I would say that as Latin American companies got to know their Chinese partners better, there was a bit of a maturation of the relationship. But what I would argue now is we are actually in a situation where with COVID-19, China is poised to have a new wave and far more rapid and far more significant than what happened in 2008 to 2010, which is a rapid expansion of the Chinese physical presence in Latin America as, as elsewhere. And with that is going to come an accompanying series of pushback and tensions and probably concerns for Washington. Now, having said that, I want to go to what I believe is the core concept of how we can understand the relationship between China's economic activities and its strategic activities. Specifically, you see my, um, my, my Venn diagram here. And as I suggested before, you have um, you know, China's acquisition on the ground of an ever greater presence in sectors like petroleum and mining and, and food stuff in order to get the things that it needs for um, its, uh, you know, its own economic activities. On the other hand, as you see on the right hand side, China needs to do certain things to position itself through technology dominance and through um, other activities to basically have access for its goods and services, especially in the high value added sectors, telecommunications, certain construction things, certain other types of services, port services, in order to be in those leading edge spaces to, to frankly make money. But um, at the bottom, there's also a piece that goes a little bit beyond just access to goods and markets, which is the dominance of the connectivity in the region that I alluded to before. And this goes again, first we saw it in ports and in construction of railroads, then we see it in terms of the operation of things through toll roads and, and what they call hydro vias with respect to rivers. Um, you see it in, in domination of telecommunication connectivity, electric um, electricity generation and transmission in e-commerce. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, but my point really is that in the intersection of those activities, you have, I think, a very important concept to understand, which is that China achieves an economic synergy, which then gives it political leverage. It uses this political leverage not to create client states, but rather it uses that political leverage principally to farther advance its economic position. Because for China, it's all about the money. It's all about China. But at the end of the day, China does have to do certain political things to maneuver in the international political space, which it does too. And again, you see the military and police activities piece going off to the side. The key part there is this idea that China actively, you know, it, China is not leading with its military, but military becomes relevant in two ways. In the short and near term, as China becomes increasingly globally engaged, it has to do things like counter piracy operations. It has to be prepared for NEOs. It has to develop good relationships with Latin American militaries and other militaries and places where, where it's operating, as the United States and others have. Um, over the long term, China deeply believes that it may have to go to war against the United States or, or others. And so the PLA, just like other responsible militaries, um, you know, actively plans for how it would do that and how it would not only just you know, fight the United States in Asia, but if there were ever such a conflagration, how it would have a multidimensional global strategy to bring pressure in other theaters, maybe in asymmetric ways, um, but possibly through, you know, in the second phase of a, a campaign, you know, how it might in a prolonged conflict be able to get certain partners to give it access to airfields and bases to put U.S. assets and especially U.S. sustainable deployment assets at risk. Again, it's not part of a nefarious plot for global domination in my view. It's part of a plot for China to be economically on top of the world, but fearful that other established powers are not going to like it for it to do so. So that's why I emphasize once again, this idea that this is an in support of the economic strategy. Let me say a few more things. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these slides, but with respect to each of the things I just talked about, 
um, resource activities, a petroleum sector. So for example, um, Venezuela's case is well known, the access to Venezuelan oil where China and Russia really dominate that sector now. In other places, for example, Ecuador under the previous socialist government or Rafael Correa, the way in which China came in through CNPC, Petro Ecuador, and now has a dominant position um, with Andes Petroleum and, and others, um, and, and also structured through what they call loans for oil deals. In places like, like Peru, where it actually, through the acquisition of a stake of Petrobras recently, um, has a, a significant stake in, in the oil sector. Um, in Brazil, with a major play in the Libra offshore oil fields, um, and even in Mexico, less known, but right across from the U.S. part of the Gulf of Mexico, in what's called the Perdido Basin, um, uh, CNOC actually has a major uh, role. And, and of course, uh, in Guyana's new oil play, a, a approximately 25% play there for CNUG behind ExxonMobil and the new Staybrook oil fields. In mining, you see similar things. For example, in Peru, you have about seven major Chinese mining companies, 25% uh, of Peruvian um, copper output, 100%, basically one major Chinese operated mine accounts for all of Peru's copper exports, for example, uh, going abroad. Um, and the list goes on and on. And uh, um, But I also want to emphasize that it's not just traditional mining activities. Again, again uh, you know, Chile exports uh, you know, the vast majority of its copper and as well as potassium nitrates uh, to the PRC. But it's also um, rare earths, things like lithium, where China increasingly dominates the entire lithium to battery supply chain that is critical for firms such as Tesla, as well as a, you know, a range of different batteries. So in the lithium triangle area, um, so in the Atacama Desert in, in Chile, um, in the north of, of Argentina, in places like Jujuy, um, in the Salar de Uyuni in, in Bolivia, you see major Chinese firms such as Tianqi, as well as Gangfing Lithium. And even in Mexico, one of the possibly the world's largest new lithium plays in, in Latin America, Gangfing has a, a major new activity as well as rare earths beyond what I just mentioned. So things like niobiome, for example, where one finds the majority of that in Brazil, also with significant defense applications, you find China very dominantly in that space. Um, with respect to agriculture, um, the talk about uh, China's uh, land grabs and things like that, I think was, was largely misunderstood. Where you really see China now is, first of all, it its major agricultural purchasing company, China Oil Seeds and Food Steps Corporation, or COFCO, has bought into um, some major agro-logistics firms, such as Nadera and Noble, which are having a major presence in places like Argentina, and even indirectly in places where uh, China is not diplomatically recognized, such as Paraguay. Beyond that, you see some interesting dynamics. Um, China is moving from just buying presence that it needs through M&A to increasingly developing its own capabilities, such as in the Libra oil fields in Brazil, I mentioned. It's moving from just owning extractive operations, such as the, the mines in Peru that I mentioned, to increasingly working with local partners um, and, and learning and being ever more sophisticated. It is also in many places adopting minority shares. So one of the ways, for example, it stays below the radar with respect to rare earths is that oftentimes its ownership stakes is, you know, for example, in the case of CBMM, about 10 to percent or 20 percent, which gives it the option of increasing that, but without some of the political heat. With respect to technology, you see that not only just in telecommunications, but in things like agriculture. For example, Nadero, Nadera had some major GMOC technology of interest to the Chinese. Or for example, its presence, CNUC and CNODC, um, the, the presence in the Libra oil field allowed it to advance in deep water drilling, which it exploited globally in its operations. Um, and frankly, as I mentioned before, leveraging of the demand. So a, an enormous soy, purchasers such as Kafka has repeatedly used that demand to basically have it hold a hammer above its partners. So in Argentina in 2010, cutting off its purchase of Argentine soy oil um, in order to force the, um, the Argentines to open up their market to Chinese trains and, and other things. Uh, and the examples go, go on and on. Even major national, international players such as Vali in, in Brazil using access to the Chinese market and the ability to regulate those purchases to help force Chinese... <laughs> 
with respect to what I called connectivity activities, let me explain this also a little bit better. We think traditionally, I think somebody has a live mic here, um, but we think uh, traditionally connectivity activities um, with respect to um, highway construction. And so it goes beyond just the Hutchison Wampoa operated ports, which are indeed the case in Panama, as well as Freeport, very close to, to the United States, as well as um, in uh, Mexico and, and even in Argentina. But it also goes to support by companies like China Harbor for the major new port that's being built in support of DP World, the, the port of Pisorca in, in Ecuador, or in Brazil, a new multidimensional mega port that's going to be built in Sao Luis, and prospective ports all across the Caribbean, from Casado in the Dominican Republic uh, to the previous possibility of La Union in, in El Salvador, um, to even in, in Guyana, possibly a new major port at Burbas, um, and also uh, China Merchants Port Holdings, a major port that may be built in King. Town, Jamaica, taking advantage of the fact that uh, the Caribbean is a logistics hub naturally to support both the South American as well as U.S. North American uh, seaboard operations. And of course, we're familiar with highways and bridges and roads and, and some of the talk about, for example, trains uh, that go across, uh, you know, that would have gone across Argentina and other places. But one of the interesting things that you see is a change is that it's not just about finding government to government deals paid for by, by loans. Increasingly, in even more well-governed countries and well-institutionalized countries like, like Chile or Colombia, China is using public-private partnerships to win things that would have been unconceivable before. So for example, the major project of the Bogota Metro on top of a, another Colombia project the, from going from Medellin to the Gulf of Uruba, or the Santiago Metro in Chile, or the North-South Highway in Jamaica, for example. And you even see how China is learning through acquisitions. So for example, a Portugal-based co company called Moda Engel, the way in which China Communications and, and Construction Corporation bought a 30% stake in Moda Engel, which is very good at PPPs as a way of getting it farther into that space to compete globally more effective than PPPs. The list goes on. But it's also not just ground transportation. So some very, very interesting uh, advances in the area of what are called hydro vias, basically the dredging and operating of riverine toll roads. Uh, there are some in Peru, for example, in the Peruvian Amazon. There are some elsewhere. But perhaps the most strategically significant one in Latin America um, is the Paraguay-Paraná River Corridor. And why is it important? It's because the majority of agricultural exports, uh, soy, soy oils, corn, beef, of five South American nations, Argentina, Brazil, um, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia, all go out that. And so the prospect of Shanghai dredging winning the contract to operate that and decides who gets priority rather than the Belgian firm, Jean de Nol, um, is a problem. But frighteningly, the new Peronist, uh, essentially populist anti-US government of Alberto and Cristina Fernandez in Argentina is the government that gets to decide who operates that dredging contract. And it looks very likely that it will go to, to Sinohydro. So again, helping to understand how this connectivity thing creates strategic imperatives. And there are other things. Um, again, China is moving from building to actually operating infrastructure, operating ports, as I mentioned before, um, operating toll roads, for example, the North-South Highway in Jamaica and, and the, uh, you know, the, the Columbia 4G highways that I mentioned before. Um, and it goes beyond the physical infrastructure. It also goes, as I indicated, to electricity infrastructure. So a number of different hydropower generation projects. China literally has built six major hydroelectric facilities in Ecuador, three in Bolivia, um, it operates various other ones in Peru. It has made major advances in wind and solar. China is the builder of two of the largest um, solar uh, photovoltaic uh, displays in all of the Americas, uh, the Cachari facility in Argentina in the north, as well as the Atacama Desert facility in, in, in Chile. It's also um, the only major nuclear plate that's going forth in the hemisphere, at least outside of whatever could happen in the United States, the uh, use of a Chinese Heliolong-1 reactor to um, advance Argentina's uh, Tucha nuclear complex. And, and also some talk about the Angri, Angra complex, although that's a little bit farther down the road, China helping Brazil maybe modernize its nuclear capability. But it goes beyond just generation. China is also dominating the transmission space. 
State Grid, China's major electricity uh, transmission provider, as well as China Three Gorges, who built the, that big dam in China, as well as State Power Investment Corporation, SPIC. Um, they have together put over $20 billion into ch- transmission in Peru, I'm sorry, in Brazil, and more recently have made some important acquisitions in Peru, which give them uh, control over distribution in most of, of the major area outside of Lima as well as um, in Chile, a series of acquisitions which uh, just culminated in one that's being reviewed right now by Chilean authorities, which would be the firm Natergy selling off about $3 billion in assets to China State Grid. That, if approved, would literally give Chinese firms control of 57% of all of Chile's electricity transmission capability. In other words, um, you know, if you Thinking about you know turning off the lights for the Chilean government, fifty-seven percent of those lights are basically under control of, of the Chinese, if approved by the Chilean government of Sebastian Piñera. Beyond that, again, technology and finance connectivity, so four G, five G, um, you know, again, uh, fiber optic cables, uh, a very important cable that would take major amounts of data from Chile across to maybe Hong Kong or alternatively. Um, Australia, uh, one that's going from Brazil to, I believe, Cote d'Ivoire to eventually Paraguay, uh, to, 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 mention, uh, to, to mention others. So again, uh, hopefully you're starting to see the way in which um, controlling connectivity is a strategic issue, even though one says, okay, well, there's no military alliances that China is directly threatening with, but it's nonetheless strategic. Number three, digital activities. Uh, So um, I've already talked about this, but I want to take a look at this in a different way beyond just connectivity. So number one, obviously, telecom infrastructure. We spend a lot of time talking about 5G. Um, Brazil's 5G auction, which Huawei is likely to win, is probably going to go forward, I believe, in May. Argentina is going to have a major 5G auction at which Huawei is likely to win in probably 2022. There are a number of, of other states, including states friendly to the United States, also looking towards 5G. Um, but China is already dominant in 3G, 4G, telephone equipment, smartphones, and other things across the region, including to companies such as uh, Telefonica, in Claro, in Digicel, uh, among others. Um, China is also exporting its surveillance architectures. So company, countries like Ecuador, um, Echo 911 is, is the largest. Uh, it basically is an emergency system across the country of, of cameras and call centers and emergency response. Bolivia has a smaller one, BOL 110. But there are similar systems with digital facial recognition cameras that can actually tie in other types of data and associate it with the individuals captured on the camera, um, not only for law enforcement, but, but other applications. In Panama, in uh, the borders of, of Uruguay, in Jujuy, Argentina, j- just to name a few. One of the biggest initiatives by which China is pushing these technologies, what are called smart cities. So if you have insecurity, naturally you want to have the ability to recognize people and be able to digitally associate, you know, who is this person of, of concern, um, to be able to capture crime, to have rapid response, to even be able in smart cities to be able to, uh, you know, better manage transportation and digital payments and have it all be tied together. The risk, however, is that when you associate individual identity with payment, with positional data, you get the ability, just like we talk about in in the West, to gain an awful lot of information about the people that are under those surveillance cameras in these, these places. And when that processing all too often is done offsite, oftentimes in hubs in China or outside the countries, um, that gives those Chinese firms enormous access to the personal data of millions and millions of citizens of of our partners' nation. And the risk of that, again, many of you know this, but China's 2017 national security law says that the Chinese government, if it feels a, a use or a need to, can oblige companies like Huawei to turn over that data. And while Huawei says, well, we would never violate individual sovereignty, it says it in the law. Um, And China again and again through the MSS um, and through its security services actively seek to rob data, whether it's commercial or, or other data. And so, you know, China's practice consistently across, especially the past two decades, and especially under President Xi, gives every reason to be concerned that the more you have 
China built smart cities architectures and telecom architectures, that puts not only the military data, but also the personal data of Latin America leaders, uh, Latin America business leaders, corporate secrets and things at risk. And is it just to support military advance? No. To go back to my previous argument, the risk is that China uses that data to advance its economic position to further its economic influence. And so it becomes a reinforcement cycle. Going beyond this, again, um, there are some other dimensions that are important besides just the intelligence. Um, number one, China helps its friends to do what it does in China. China uses its surveillance architectures now and things such as social credit systems to help restrict those who are not friendly to the regimes, those who are, whose behavior, whether it's on social media, et cetera, is not seen as, as desirable and reward others whose behavior is. Already in Venezuela, for example, through something called the Fatherland Identity Card, as well as activities by CEIEC, um, documented by our State Department to, uh, to, to essentially uh, go after the, the opposition, to help Maduro go after the opposition, China has already shown that it is helping its friends through its architectures to, in a lesser extent, restrict those who would pose those regimes in the same way that it restricts those who would oppose its own regime. And so this idea of China exporting its digital authoritarianism to not only undermine democracy, but basically help its friends to stay in power is something that is increasingly becoming a matter of concern. And the more China gets involved in this space, the more it dominates technologies like AI, the more it dominates technologies like robotics, the more it dominates things like 5G, the harder it becomes to say, well, why shouldn't we go with somebody other than Huawei? Because as we found out, for example, years and years ago, when we lost our dominance in, for example, LCD panel displays that were important for our defense sector, once you lose the commercial edge, you suddenly find yourself strategically vulnerable and, and hard to say, well, we have to go with Huawei. Um, okay, so let me turn away from the purely economic and, and cover just a few other topics here. So number one, this idea of um, the way in which uh, China uses its soft power. And I would argue that it's different from U.S. soft power because we think of U.S. soft power, people in Latin America have gone to U.S. universities, maybe University of Chicago, and then go back and, are in, and make economic policies for their countries based on neoclassical things that they learned at the University of Chicago. There is a little bit of that. People actually do go to, to China and, and see the you know, advances that China has made under scientific socialism and, and apply some of that, especially in company, countries like, like, like Cuba or, or to a lesser degree Venezuela. But more importantly, I would argue, is that a lot of it with China is the expectation of benefit or the fear of punishment, which goes hand in hand with the mistrust. So oftentimes we say, well, people don't trust China. They're skeptical of China. They don't like their authoritarian influence. So everything's okay. But I would argue that it is entirely the case that people in Latin America, including Latin American leaders, uh, are skeptical of that authoritarianism and skeptical of, of China's um, predatory business practices. And yet they still hope to have other, other things. China makes its predatory nature and its willingness to use a big stick known. Um, when Australia, for example, dared to question the origins of coronavirus, suddenly China cut off purchases of Australian pork. When the Argentine government in 2010 was too protectionist, China, in a very you know, you know, friendly way, cut off $2 billion worth of purchases of Argentine soy oil until Argentina's government changed their tune. Um, when Canada, our, our friends to the north, dared to honor an extradition treaty with the United States and arrest um, uh, Huawei's uh, chief operations officer, Meng, um, China rapidly arrested on complete false pretenses to Canadian diplomats. And the list goes on and on. Indeed, one could say that the seemingly ridiculous blacklisting of our former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, as well as John Bolton and others, from ever being able to, to visit China, in many ways sent a chilling signal to any Latin American and other leaders who would dare defy China, that you know, we can blacklist your leaders just in the same way that you know, the US is going to do sanctions. So at the end of the day, 
what you find is that again and again, um, on the one hand, you have um, business leaders in, in the region who hope to get rich by being the local partner, you know, using their local connections to, to, to hitch up with a, a, a Chinese firm um, or get access to the Chinese market, or at least not be shut out of the Chinese market. But it also operates at a more micro level. So you have consultants who get these lucrative trips to China under people-to-people diplomacy, um, who are afraid that if they start speaking out ill of China in their reports, that they'll lose that access. Academics, this happens with all all the time. It's difficult to find Latin American academics who speak Mandarin, who don't get regular China paid trips. um, And to a certain extent, depend on that continued goodwill from the Chinese government. And so, you know, does that cause you to tone down? China has a very active media diplomacy. They not only buy very lucrative spots in, in many Latin American and other um, media outlets and provide feeds through CGTN and, and other things, but they also bring hundreds and hundreds of media personnel over to China for very pleasant trips. That's not to say that those who go become Chinese propagandists, but when you've had a nice trip, you certainly don't want to seem ungrateful by coming out with a too anti-Chinese story, or at the very least, you want to double check your facts before you report that that critical thing of, of China. And so what happens is, again, it's not propagandizing like we think in the old Soviet days, but it's in subtle ways silencing one or not being critical or not raising the flag too much. So it truncates Latin America's ability to collectively organize to demand things of China or to speak out against what happens with the 2 million Uyghurs in concentration camps in Xinjiang or or other predatory behaviors. Um, And in truncating the discourse, it allows China to move into those spaces with less resistance until little by little, um, you know, the ability to push back in terms of of China's growing economic and political influence in the webs is almost too great to resist. Let me say a few things now about military engagement. And certainly, as I highlighted, military engagement is not the most important aspect of Chinese engagement, but it is growing. I think of three categories. Number one, arms sales. So you see in the case of Venezuela, but also to a lesser extent, uh, Ecuador under Rafael Correa, Bolivia under Evo Morales, that um, it's moved forward from just uniforms and military um, you know, non-lethals to the sale of radars in the case of Venezuela, the case of, um, of uh, you know, military trucks. And oftentimes these things are donated and Later, when companies like Norinco get a foot in the door, they, they seek to actually sell. Um, aircraft, such as, um, again, Venezuela. China came in in Venezuela with the K-8 fighter, as well as the, the J-8 and, I'm sorry, the Y-8 and Y-12 military transport. It's now seeking to come in, for example, with the new leftist populist government in Argentina, something that it tried to do in 2015 under Cristina, but is trying to do now again with the what is called the JF-17. It's somewhat of an inappropriate, uh, essentially heavy fighter bomber um, for, for the role. But, but again, it has a very lucrative finance package and especially after Argentina lost its ability to, to be able to buy, I believe it was the, um, you know, some of the other European uh, alternatives and the Korean alternative, uh, the Chinese offering became much more lucrative as well as um, other things like uh, offshore patrol vessels, OPVs, which it actually first sold to the center, but center left government of, of, um, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, but now is looking at, at selling maybe um, in some other places, as well as armored vehicles. And actually, Argentina already bought a small number of armored vehicles many, many years ago, the WMZ 551, but it's looking to buy, buy more. Or Peru, in the case of Peru, with its purchase of a, a Chinese, basically, a multiple launch rocket system solution, the Type 90B, actually beating out the Soviet, the Russians, who wanted to sell an upgrade to their BM-21 Smirch system. So oftentimes, China is not competing head to get against the U.S. offering, but it's competing head to get against, for example, the Russians or, or other kind of mid-level offerings. But it's still moving up the value added chain. And in the process, it's supporting its all around military relationship. It's increasing its ability to internationally maintain and support and do training of these things. And, and so it's, it's increasing the ability of the PLA to have first rate equipment internationally engaged and supported. 
but it goes beyond just the equipment because it also, and, and, all, and oh, by the way, it's not just military forces, but also police forces. Oftentimes donation of squad cars or motorcycles, every place from Trinidad and Tobago to Guyana to many places in South America. Um, with respect to training and PME relationships, um, China has short courses in Champaign in places like um, in, in, in where, where it brings people from just about every country in Latin America to recognize it. It has longer courses, so its version of a, an Army and Navy Command General Staff course um, in uh, Nanjing and, and went outside of Nanjing. Um, some others, for example, it started to accept uh, certain countries uh, sending cadets to its full PLA Academy, which is conducted actually in Mandarin. Um, and other things, it's beginning to send some of, of its PLA personnel to Latin America, for example, um, under the previous Colombian government of Juan Manuel Santos, um, although the current Colombian government has, has ceased this, uh, it actually sent uh, Chinese PLA personnel to the elite Lanceros Special Operations course. It did something similar with the Jungle Warfare School in Manaus. And, and why? In part, it's basically to understand what it's all about. And for example, in the case of Manaus, it got into talks with the Brazilian army and actually used its experience in Manaus and its coordination with Brazil to help kind of take the best insights from that um, and set up something similar in the south of China. Um, and, and actually with Brazil's world-renowned peacekeeping uh, school, uh, Sekopab, it's done similar things with similar talks with Sekopab on, on various different occasions. So again, the engagement helps its all around engagements um, and it does a lot of institutional visits for the same reasons. Um, and if ever wanted to use that in the future, but it also helps its ability to um, you know, increase its own internal capabilities. Um, China also has had some presence in Latin America itself. So for example, it sent military police to the Minista peacekeeping force in Haiti from 2004 through 2012 to gain valuable experience there working under the Brazilians. It has sent its hospital ship, the Peace Ark, to the region three times, first in, in 2011, then 2015, and then in, in 2018, 2019, each time more sophisticated than the first. It has sent uh, um, its, uh, its, uh, its PLA Navy assets to the region, um, including doing some combat exercises in 2013, first with the Chileans and then sailing through the Straits of Magellan and working with the Argentines and, 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 and the Brazilians, although that has not been repeated as I understand it, um, sending one of its uh, Intel ships to, to Cuba, parked in Havana Harbor in, in November, to, or I'm sorry, January 2016. So it has, it's, it's a very cautious presence operation, um, but you do see it uh, you know, expanding to, to a certain degree. Space activities. You find that China has an increasingly broad range of space activities. Um, Brazil, because the United States was reluctant to launch satellites for the Brazilians back in the 90s, worried about, um, at the time, uh, you know, Brazil's ability to develop a, a, um, a, a, a missile nuclear program. But uh, China kind of got on the bandwagon there and to this day continues to co-develop satellites for Brazil under the Cybers, China-Brazil Earth Research Satellite Program. And literally just about a year ago, launched the most recent one in, in the program. Venezuela has built, um, has launched and, and developed uh, three satellites with, with the Chinese, all launched from China. And indeed, the entire Venezuelan ground architecture for those communications, as well as the, um, the personnel who are trained, virtually all of them have been trained in China. So again, if the technical architecture is Chinese, if the personnel is trained in China, if the satellites themselves are developed in China, um, you recognize that it gives the Chinese potential access to architectures which frankly pass signals from a number of different relatively sensitive orbits. Um, Bolivia, one uh, real-time sensing satellite was the case there. Argentina, the, the famous uh, space-based Bajado de Agrio Noiquen. I actually believe that the primary purpose of that is, is what the Chinese say it is, which is as the Chinese go to lunar missions like Chang'e, as the Chinese go to Mars missions and other things uh, with a rotating Earth, China already has the ship-based uh, systems for maintaining global contact with um, beyond Earth space assets. And so, yes, um, its, it's base in Argentina is consistent with that purpose, although there is the question of can it suck in other types of signals from, you know, uh, space assets passing overhead? Um, yes. Does the Argentine government have good regular access? Not completely. So um, while I don't think it's a um, explicitly military asset, it does raise some items of, of concern.
Um, and there are the various other ways. Um, actually, China has played a role in the RSAT program in Argentina. It's active with Argentine uh, commercial space launch activities. It has multiple observatories set up in, in, in Chile, et cetera, et cetera. Very briefly, I should mention, um, as we're running uh, towards the end of uh, my formal remarks, that uh, um, as you have commercial ties and other legitimate ties, you also have business ties and financial ties in the illegitimate space. So long for a long time, especially in the Caribbean <coughs> and, and also in the Andean Ridge, you had um, the use of Chinese communities to smuggle Chinese personnel oftentimes going eventually to the United States, but along the way working in Chinese shops in, in those relatively closed Chinese communities. But in recent years, it's gone beyond that to include also the increasing importance of China as a um, source of precursor chemicals, things such as ephedrine and pseudoephedrine for methamphetamines, as well as the very lethal drug fentanyl. Actually, Wuhan, AKA, you know, the Wuhan virus was actually the source of, of fentanyl. Um, uh, and, and actually, yeah, that creates some interesting dynamics. At the same time, you also find that the increasing commercial flows make China an increasingly important um, source for the trafficking and contraband goods, uh, as, as well as the trade-based money laundering and other forces, uh, sources of money laundering, especially as Chinese banks, such as China Construction Bank and ICBC, set up branch operations in Latin America. Uh, things such as Union Pay set up shops in, in Latin America. And as you have Latin Americans who are increasingly financially interfacing in China, including through e-commerce, Alibaba, Tencent, that, that type of thing. Um, the opportunities to have China components of, of money laundering um, are, are increasing. And with that trans transnational organized crime comes a, a risk, which is that on the one hand, you have a real need oftentimes for linguistic translation services and facilitation, but you also have a, a very real risk um, that has happened in the case of Argentina, bringing in the Chinese national police to help in an operation to take down the Pichuay organization, um, that as the Chinese get more and more um, involved and get more insights into, okay, you know, who's under investigation, who's corrupt, that that insight in criminal cooperation opens up vulnerability by which the Chinese use that intelligence potentially to advance their commercial and other strategic objectives. And finally, um, I see that uh, with COVID, you have an opportunity for a dramatic multidimensional advance of China's presence, albeit with significant pushback. So we already see significant, um, you know, mask diplomacy and another thing, although there were a lot of problems with that. So for example, in the case of Peru, a lot of the quick tests, the, the, um, the antibody tests that China sold were defective, that caused major problems for the Peruvian government. Um, a lot of the ventilators that China provided that oftentimes it sold instead of donated didn't work. However, for example, vaccines right now, because China could not get, I believe it was the AstraZeneca vaccine rapidly enough, um, it forced the Brazilian government to try to negotiate, to try to get more vaccine from the Chinese. Um, the same case in Argentina. Um, the Argentine government is negotiating to try to get more vaccine, the Sinovac vaccine. But again, that real human need creates leverage. So for example, in the case of Brazil, it was actually reported that the Chinese informally suggested to the Brazilian government that if they just got rid of that anti-Chinese foreign minister that they have, Araujo, that that would really help the uh, Chinese get more, more vaccine. Now that was never a formal public request, but it was actually reported on in, in the Brazilian media that that was actually made. Um, you see an increasing importance of China in trade as a purchaser of Brazilian soy, Ecuadorian shrimp, El Salvadorian sugar, especially as traditional markets like the US and Europe continue to flounder. And China becomes increasingly an important player as its economy is expected to expand 8.1% this year. As you move though, into 2021 and 2022, um, and go back to one of my first slides, I believe that the same thing that happened after the 28 crisis will very, very much happen again, which is that um, Europe-based companies and US-based companies and other Western companies will look at their poorly performing assets in Latin America. They will be trying to shore up their international positions. And so they will say, 
well, we want to get more into our traditional markets like Asia. So we want to sell off some of our troubled non-performing Latin American assets. And so who will be there just like in 2010 to buy up those assets, but the Chinese. So ironically, um, what you will actually have is an expansion in about 2022 um, across the board of China's presence. Also, by the way, China um, in the poorly performing you know, economic difficulties of, of Latin America. For example, the Argentine government really needs those loan back Chinese projects, things like the $4.7 billion financing for the Belgrano uh, Cargas rail expansion or Ecuador, um, who um, you know, up until you know, our offer to help buy them out of their Chinese loans was negotiating a new $2.4 billion Chinese line of credit to deal with their very, very serious fiscal difficulties. Or in Mexico, as leftist populist Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador um, tries to do a policy of the national uh, oil company Pemex to, to get projects like the Dos Bocas refinery, um, you know, which, in which the Chinese are already involved, or expand oil production in an environment in which it's very hostile for Western investors, who is the logical one to come in with loans? Um, the Chinese. And they've actually already offered this to the previous government. Uh, or, for example, um, China already active in the, uh, the Maya train project, uh, a very important developmental project for the south of Mexico, um, who is well positioned to come in and to provide you know, more infrastructure support, but, but the Chinese. Or, for example, at a time in which the, um, you know, the AMLU government is really doing just about everything that they can to push private sector investors out of the clean energy sector in, in Mexico, um, who is the one company that just actually bought up a major presence in Mexican clean energy, specifically buying up Zuma Electric, um, and is now positioned to come in with loans um, at a time when AMLO desperately needs it because nobody else wants to put money into Mexico under these conditions, but China. And so in many ways, the very desperation of Latin American governments in this context set China up to dramatically expand. As that happened though, just like happened in 20, um, 2010, 2012, um, there will be a lot of errors made by the, the expanded Chinese companies in terms of labor relations, worker relations, environmental compliance and other things. Um, and also these Chinese companies are coming in in an environment, this is not the same Latin America of 2018 or 2019. Um, as our Chilean colleagues can talk about, as our Ecuadorian colleagues can talk about, our Colombian colleagues, um, this is a new environment of vast social protest, more people out of work, more people who are socially mobilized, more people who have led been suspicious of, of the Chinese. And so the irony is you're going to have a train wreck. You're going to have a dramatically increased Chinese presence in an environment in which there's more social mobilization, security threats, and resistance to that. At the same time, there's also more concern in Washington. Now, what way, how will that all pan out? Too early to say, I think, at this, this time, but I think it will become an even bigger issue now for the Biden administration than it already, already has 